back with me this hour, defense attorney and former prosecutor Florina Altshuler and former prosecutor and media law professor Walter Gabriel. Thank you both. What a day in the Jinx murder trial. Florina, we've been talking about it. I want to join Walter now in on his impressions of the scathing cross-examination of Dr. Loftus, who has literally been on cross-examination the entire day. What are your thoughts? Well, I have a lot of thoughts. Um, uh, for starters, as, as the, uh, the defense expert stated, the prosecutor is somewhat of a bully, and it, it kind of came across during that exchange that we just saw there, but I thought he did a great job of discrediting her. Uh, experts are not supposed to be purely hired guns, and that's a concept that he got across to the jury, and uh, towards the end, he also tied her uh, and, had, and brought out her associations with some people of questionable character. So I, I think uh, he ended very strongly in his cross-examination for the day. And the jury has a lot to think about um, from his cross-examination of And they were taking notes. We have a producer inside the courtroom. They were taking notes, looking at each other during the many, many long sidebars during the cross-examination, Florina. But she's still under cross-examination. What do you think this effect is having cumulatively? I'm, I've been listening throughout the day. I hear a lot of repetition on some of the questions he's asking on cross. Maybe he's looking for a different answer, but he's really criticizing her work, her history, her uh, past uh, testimonies and cases that she's worked on. He's pointing out biases to the defense. He's even criticizing her looking over to the jury and talking to the jury when she answers questions. How do you think that overall impression is, I guess, on day one of cross-examination? Well, you know what? He's criticizing everything, Chanley, that you just said he's criticizing. But what is he not criticizing? He's not criticizing the basis of the opinions that she gave, the scientific substance that she offered. I think that's really notable. His cross-examination, as lengthy as it was, was almost entirely collateral. I thought he put a lot of focus on her association with accused child molesters and her testimony in cases involving child molestation. That has nothing to do with this case. But the idea is if he can connect her with, you know, very much so disliked people in society, then maybe the jury will have a bad taste in their mouth for her. And that's really unfair. That's collateral and not at all related to what she's testifying about here. Certainly he was able to do it because he was trying to argue bias. He was trying to argue that this somehow affects her opinion and that the opinion is not an unbiased opinion. But I think if the jury is smart and if they think about what the questioning was really about, it was much ado about nothing. And when she wouldn't agree with him, he was like a petulant child just repeating and repeating and repeating each time hoping to get a different answer and it was not effective yeah i i'm with you there florina might be turning off the jury i know i was being uh, tired i'm sure dr loftus is tired tonight after that full day of cross but walter is this not an indication of what we may see when robert durst himself takes the witness stand prosecutor lewin it's gonna he may spend up to a week cross-examining Robert Durst. It's it's going to be a while. And not only is he going to cross-examine um, this defendant based on the, the evidence and, and what they've shown for, for this crime, but remember, it's also for the for the previous trial, and it's also uh, asking him, you know, they're going to cross him on all the statements he's made in the recorded interviews that the jury has seen uh, throughout the 30-plus days of this trial. So, yeah, it's, it's going to go for a while. It's going to go for days, for sure. And um, it's just a matter of how many days. I agree. And we will be here. Court TV will be here to bring it to our viewers live when Robert Durst does take the stand, possibly even tomorrow. And we will, of course, have it all here for you. And up next, we are going to get you caught up on the other murder trial. We are bringing you live here on Court TV, the quadruple murder case out of North Dakota, where I am right now. Don't go anywhere. This is Court TV, your front row seat to justice. Maude Arbery was jogging when he was followed by three men. He's trapped. He was just jogging. Burning in the streets. He was my baby. How many of us live in a community where we think everything is OK? We're going to go deep. We drove across the state to get here. We're working hard to get you the news you need.
we dig a little deeper on the stories of the day. That's why we're here. To help start making sense of it all. You know, this is the evil part of it all. An all new true crime series. It was justifiable homicide. I swung the hammer and I hit her. And I just fired the gun. This is the whole truth. Can you keep my life straight? Behind the true crime. Judgment with Ashley Banfield. All new episodes, Sunday nights at 8, 7 Central on Court TV. Native women have told me that what you do when you raise a daughter is you prepare her for what to do when she's raped, not if, but when. Why are we different than every other person? Why don't we have the justice everybody else does? This is Court TV. What a day it has been as we continue our gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage. Is there reasonable doubt? We'll find out. Welcome back to Court TV Live. Your front row seat to justice. Welcome to Court TV Live, your front row seat to justice. It's a busy day here at Court TV. And it could go one way or the other. You have to look at everything in this case. He murdered our daughter. Can you take the hose and squeeze it? We are live in courtrooms across the country. This is true crime all the time. We continue our gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage. Jury selection is underway. This is what I love to do. I'm Vinny Politan. You know, I stood before a jury on both sides of the courtroom, first as a prosecutor, then as a defense attorney. But with Court TV, you're the jury. You see every moment of testimony. Y'all know I didn't do this. Every story unfold. I'm sorry for my crime. Until a verdict is rendered and justice is served. The all new Court TV, your front row seat to justice. This is true crime all the time. We continue our gavel to gavel coverage. We are live in courtrooms across the country. This is what I love to do. Lori Vallow Daybell and her husband Chad. It went from a story about two missing children to remains that were found. It's the doomsday couple on trial. What do you think the future looks like? We see the storms getting worse. Bad news is, you're in prison. More people are coming into VR every day. Are we in a killer robots arms race right now? I observed a female body laying in the second bathroom uh, uh, in the doorway, kind of half in, half out of the doorway. What half was in and what half was out? Um, her upper torso was inside the bathroom and her legs, lower area, was outside. And is that female Lois Cobb? Correct. Okay. What did you do when you encountered Lois Cobb? Um, I, observed, I observed that there was, she was laying in a pool of blood. Um, so Officer Tessis and I were um, going to uh, s try to awake her, see if she was alive still. Um, we're going to start to pull her out of that doorway so that we could access um, like her arms and neck area to check for a pulse. Um, I observed that there was very deep cuts to her neck um, to the point that uh, it was almost completely through her neck uh, all the way where her head was almost completely uh, cut off. You're watching Court TV Live. I'm Chanley Painter. We are bringing you live gavel to gavel coverage of the quadruple murder in a small town, North Dakota versus Chad Isaac. 
The 47-year-old chiropractor Chad Isaac is accused of walking into a property management company and shooting and stabbing to death the company owner and three other people who work there. Now, Isaac lived at a trailer park managed by the company, but he had been a model tenant and did not appear to have any problems with the company. Well, today in opening statements, the state focused on the evidence. Surveillance footage from inside the company shows a suspect wearing an orange jacket and a mask walking around inside the building the mornings of the murders. The state says this man is Chad Isaac, and they say this, along with witness testimony and forensic evidence, will prove that the defendant is the man who walked into the building and killed four people. But the defense told the jury that investigators arrested the wrong man. So let's unpack today's biggest moments in court. Back with me, defense attorney and former prosecutor Florina Altschiller and former prosecutor and media law professor Walter Gabriel. It was a big day here in North Dakota where I am right now. But these opening statements, unexpected to me, Walter, was how detailed the defense came out of the gate. 90 minutes of opening statement, really going through piece by piece all the evidence and showing how it does not link the client, their client, Chad Isaac, to any of the four murders that morning. What'd you take? I, I agree with you. You know, uh, when you have a case like this, you, as a defense attorney, typically um, you can play a bit more conservative get open statement because when you've watched the jury ahead of time, uh, you, you typically like to state the law and state how uh, this is all the state's burden, and you explain what proof beyond a reasonable doubt is. You, uh, as a defense attorney, often explain that you don't even have to present a case to a jury, and a jury could still very well find that the defendant is not guilty. So to see them uh, make that much of a of a case in their opening statement was a bit of a surprise, uh, given what we, uh, given what little information we had coming into this case. But it, it was still a surprise to me. They talk about the clothing, the, everything that the prosecution really has in this case, and they t say how it doesn't connect Chad Isaac to anything, including DNA. Everything was tested for DNA. There was a part of that opening I want to play for you, and then I want to get Florina your thoughts about it on the other side. Let's watch. Recall that they also seized fingernails from Dr. Isaac, and they also when you say fingernails, it's fingernail clippings. They don't pull your fingernails. Fingernail clippings. Um, and they also did the same thing from all four victims. No DNA evidence of the victims were on Dr. Isaac's fingernails or his person, and no in DNA of Dr. Isaac was found on the victims. There was also no DNA of the victims in Dr. Isaac's home. There was no DNA from the victims in Dr. Isaac's business. There was no DNA or even evidence of blood in any of the clothing items seized from Dr. Isaac's home. And that includes the items taken from the dryer. There was no DNA or blood on any of the knives seized, and not all of it was even tested. Recall that they were looking for fingerprints on the Cobb vehicle and perhaps el elsewhere, nothing was found. All right, Florina, no DNA connecting this defendant here, but the clothing found in his dryer obviously had been washed. Even the shoes were in there, the knife, and had bleach on it, chlorine on it, the parts of the gun in the freezer, all of that information. The prosecution didn't get to yet. So that's on the minds of these jurors tonight. All of the detail the defense went through, not what the prosecution did today, I would think. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I'm surprised that the prosecutor really did not go into very many details about what the evidence will show, the specific evidence. And this gave the defense an opportunity to really take center stage and highlight all the evidence that's not there. Certainly, we know that there's explanations for it, right? All of the evidence that's recovered is recovered smelling of chlorine bleach. Well, of course, there's not going to be any DNA on it if he bleached it all. The knife that's recovered has a bent tip. Obviously, it was used to do something serious like, oh, I don't know, almost chop off someone's head. 
Of course, it's got no DNA because where's the knife found? Oh, inside the washing machine. Gun parts in the freezer. I mean, certainly this is not how you keep these things normally. Right, and they also took advantage of the no motive by pointing to others who may have had motive to do this, including the wife of the owner, possibly. We may even hear from her tomorrow, but we're running out of time. Thank you, Walter. Thank you, Florina, for joining me this evening here on Court TV. I'm Chanley Painter. It's been a pleasure being with you, but up next, don't go anywhere. Closing arguments, Michael Ayala is in for Vinnie Politan, and he'll look at some of the biggest moments today in the Jinx murder trial. Right back.